Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. There we go. Listen, let me first thank, uh, she says that I, one of her mentors, but more importantly, her dad, her late father, Pastor Farragut. He meant to many of us. And I have been close to this family for a long time. I want to especially thank you, Dr. Payton, for just putting my name in the hat. That has allowed me to be here to share with you all this morning. I also would like to thank you, Dr. Cobb, first for taking the initiative to write this grant in order that our students will be able to be engaged more in civic engagement and certainly learn more about the civil rights history, not just in Selma, but in many other, in many other cities states that civil rights prevail. I also would like to thank all of the faculty and staff that are here this morning, the guests, but especially to all of the students who have come to share on this particular program. I hope this morning that is something that I may share with you uh, that would strike a chord, particularly in an effort to impact you in a way that you would want to make a difference, not only in your life, but also in the lives of others. You know, true success, it starts in an attitude and it ends in an action. It comes from belief in oneself, and belief in one higher than oneself. However, it comes quickest to the one who combines confidence and determination with energy and enthusiasm. I say these words this morning because it was when I was seven years old, growing up in the Selma Civil Rights Movement, when my life was changing without me really even knowing it. Growing up in George Washington Carver projects from a poor family of eight during the 60s, as that little girl, it was rough. Growing up in the midst of experiencing and witnessing racial discrimination, inequality, prejudice, violence, tears, and even death of people that I had the opportunity to meet and become very close to as that little girl. Yes, these people came to Selma, Alabama in an effort to fight for our inalienable rights. And many of them, I would see them die. However, as I grew in that movement, things became much clearer to me. There were times when I was not only disobedient, but there were also times when I was scared and fearful for my life. But it was the confidence and the determination that Dr. King instilled in me as that child that gave me that energy, that enthusiasm, and the encouragement to continue on. I remember the first day that I met Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. My best friend Rachel and I would often play in front of the now historic Brown Chapel AME Church 
And this church sat right in the center of where I lived in the project. And as we were playing on this particular day, we saw these beautiful cars that had driven up into our neighborhood. We start seeing people getting out of these cars. And as little girls, we found our way walking close to the first few cars. And when we got to those cars, we saw these men who were surrounding this one particular man. One of those men were putting a black suit coat jacket on this man. And he looked at us and said, do you little girls know who this man is? And of course, we didn't know who any of them were. <laughs> he said to us, this is Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And as soon as he introduced Dr. King to us, Dr. King immediately started talking to us, asking us the normal questions that adults will ask children. He asked us our names and where do we live, and we pointed our little fingers in the direction of where we live, and he asked us where did we go to school, how we were doing in school as they were making their way to the rear of Brown's Chapel Church to have a strategy meeting on this day. He continued to ask us questions, even when we got to that back door. He said, I want to make sure you girls are doing well in school. And right after Dr. King said that to us, that same man, Dr. Payne, who introduced us to Dr. King, he said, you little girls can go on and play now because we're about to have a meeting. And Dr. King suddenly said to him, no, let them stay. And he took us by our little hands and walked us into that room where that meeting was to take place. And when he walked us into that room, he went and got two little chairs and he brought those two chairs in the back of that room and asked us to have a seat. And then Dr. King would go and get himself a chair. And he got his chair and he sat it right in front of us. And we thought we were finished with that conversation with him. But Dr. King continued to talk to us before this meeting would start. He asked us a question. He said, now, what do you little girls want? And my best friend, Rachel, and I looked at each other because we didn't know how to answer that question. He said, now, when I ask you little girls, what do you want? I want you to say what? Freedom. He said, now, what do you little girls want? Freedom. Then he said, now, say it louder, children. What do you want? Freedom. Then the next question that he would ask us, he said, now, when do you little girls want it? Now. He said, now, say it louder, children. Now. This was my first acquaintance with the late, great Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. in Selma, Alabama a day in which I would never, ever forget. A day and time that, with me not knowing the course that would be charted for me after having met this man, I couldn't wait to run out of that church, Karen, to go home and tell my parents about this man that I had met. I was very excited as that little girl. And as I was trying to explain to my parents about this special man, Dr. King, in which they obviously already knew, my dad said to me, you just better not go back out to that church. I didn't quite understand that. But even in the midst of him telling me that, I had already made up in my mind 
that I was gonna see Dr. King before he would leave. This is when I slipped back out of my back door, making my way back out to Brown Chapel Church on that day. In and out of that room, waiting for that meeting to be over. It took hours. Again, I was determined to talk to this man who had become very special to me. I'll never forget as we walked Dr. King and his entourage back to that car that they were in. Dr. King said to my best friend, and I want to see you little girls when I come back to Selma, Alabama. He said, because we're getting ready to start a movement here. And little did we know what a movement was. <laughs> All we knew is that we wanted to be at Brown Chapel AME Church when Dr. King would come back to Selma. So we were there. When that first mass meeting would take place, I slipped out of my back door again when my parents had told me not to go to that mass meeting. And both my parents worked in factories. They had to go to bed early at night because they had to wake up early in the morning because they had to be at work at 4.30 in the morning. So it was pretty easy for me to slip out of the back door. So I slipped out of the back door for this mass meeting. Our best friend and I had planned to be at that meeting. Of course, when we went to Brown Chapel Church on this particular night, we went straight to the front pew. We joined in the singing of the freedom songs. It didn't take us long to learn them. One of the first favorites that we heard was that song, Ain't Gonna Let Nobody Turn Me Right. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. There were many songs that really extended in the spirit of the people who were there, hope. And that's why freedom songs were created. And many of them were written right there in the midst of the movement to give those freedom fighters hope. And yes, Rachel and I were there and we joined in the singing of those songs and we listened to them pray as they were waiting for Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. to make his entrance in the church on that night. And I remember one song that was being led and that song was, We Shall Not Be Moved. And as soon as people start singing that song, all of a sudden, Dr. King and his entourage made their entrance to the pulpit that night. Everybody who was there started standing on their feet with excitement in their hearts. Their eyes were gleaming. And as soon as Dr. King got to the pulpit, that song changed and transitioned to another song. My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. And Dr. King just stood there looking at the people who were there. And before Dr. King would sit down on that particular night, my best friend Rachel and I would find out way sitting on his lap. And we made that a ritual. Every time that Dr. King would come to Selma to mass meetings, we would find our way sitting on Dr. King's lap. Yes, I do stand before you this morning as a product and a true testimony of the inspiration that Dr. King bestowed upon me as a child. I could tell you many things, many experiences that I had with Dr. Martin Luther King and others 
as I matriculated as a little girl through that movement. I feel very grateful to have had the opportunity, young people, to have met Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in Selma, Alabama. And yet, no matter how many tributes that I have given to Dr. Martin Luther King since his death, as I have spoken to organizations, groups, young people, schools all over the country, no matter how many tributes that I have given to this great man, I know deep down in my heart, Dr. Cobb, that I could never, ever pay the debt that I owe to this great man. But Dr. King impacted my life in a most profound way. And certainly, he has left an indelible mark and impression in the memoirs of my mind from childhood to present. And even being that child, Dr. King plucked me from poverty and the ignorance of Selma during that time, which obviously elevated my consciousness and took me to another level. Dr. King gave me hope. He gave me a sense of achievement, which motivated me to do something to make a difference, <clears throat> even in spite of my being a poor little girl. <clears throat> Dr. King motivated and inspired me, young people, to not only do my best, but to be my best and not be ashamed. He encouraged me and taught me the importance of getting good grades and even going to college during that time for the most part, black parents like mine, they weren't, they weren't even thinking about sending their children to college. First of all, they didn't have the money. All they wanted us to do was get, in, get a high school education and perhaps go to the service. But because Dr. King pricked my conscience, I made up in my mind and I was motivated enough, even though my parents couldn't afford to send me to college. I went to Tuskegee Institute and graduated with honor. Yes, Dr. King instilled in me at an early age, Andre, that regardless of my economic status in life, if I believe it, then what? If I believe it, then I what? And the only means for survival depended on determination, fortitude, adequate preparation, faith in God, and confidence in yourself. And that's one of the reasons when I went to Tuskegee, I was determined to come back wherever I landed with my career and start a youth development program. That's why I started Keep Production because it was people like Dr. King and others who touched my life and made a difference and I wanted to touch somebody else's life, particularly the disadvantaged. And after finishing college, I came to Montgomery, Alabama and I started the Keep Production Youth Development and Modeling Program. And one of the purposes for that with using the modeling vehicle was to give young people the opportunity to build self-confidence, self-esteem, so that they can break out of non-productive patterns and become great leaders and productive citizens. And for 42 years, we have been working with young people in this city and throughout the state of Alabama and making a difference and impacting their lives. Yes, so many things that happened to this little girl. 
during those turbulent times that made a significant difference in her life. And I'm standing here today to tell you that you can make a difference too. I could remember being that little girl and being in the presence of Dr. King, listening to him speaking, watching the way in which he received people, both black and white, and the way in which they received him. Every time that I heard Dr. King speak, his total demeanor sparkled. You know, everybody who wasn't afraid to come to mass meetings during that time, during the movement, it was a great spirit that exuberated in the hearts and the souls of all of those foot soldiers who were there. And even now, when I listen to Dr. King's speeches, I feel a chilling sensation that reminds me over and over again about that movement. Memories that I'll never, ever forget. However, the most traumatic experience of my life during that movement was my participation as that little girl on the Bloody Sunday March on the Edmund Pettus Bridge in 1965. This is the march where many brave foot soldiers attempted to march from Selma to Montgomery, Alabama for African Americans to gain their right to vote. Yes, young people, we didn't have that right to vote. I was there. Many threats had been made about the possibilities who would happen to anyone or what would happen to anyone who would participate on this particular march. And I must tell you that my parents and others told me over and over again that I could not participate on this march. And even my best friend, she said that she was afraid that she wasn't gonna march. But I already had made up in my mind that I wasn't going to let nobody, what? I wasn't going to let nobody turn me around. I'll never forget making my way out to Brown's Chapel Church on that day. And when I got to the church, I would normally go to the front row or the front pew. But on this particular day, I sat in the back. And as I sat there, I listened to the prayers Dr. Birch, that were being prayed. I listened to the Freedom Song. On this particular day, the late Congressman John Lewis was leading this march, along with the late Hosea Williams. They were giving special instructions to all of the brave and courageous foot soldiers who were there. And after they had given those instructions, they asked everybody to go out and line up in front of Brown's Chapel Church. And as people were passing me by, making their way out front, many of them were trying to tell me I couldn't march. And then I would fall in line and go out to get in that line. And I saw this lady who was a member of Brown's Chapel Church. She was one of the teachers who stood against the odds during that time. Because young people, there were many teachers, just like many others who were afraid to join in that movement. But she stood against the odds, the late Mrs. Margaret Moore. And I went to Mrs. Moore, and I started telling her that I wanted to march, and she was trying to discourage me. And as she was telling me I couldn't march, I started crying. And as I was crying, I stood there beside her, and that march was about to begin. 
And Mrs. Moore saw that I wasn't moving. And then she just took me by my little hands and said, come on, child. We started making our way to the Edmund Pettus Bridge on this particular day. I'll never forget as we made our way down the main street in Selma, Broad Street, I could see many whites on the sidelines who had congregated to distract the marchers. Many of them started coming up and they were spitting on the marchers. Many of them were saying ugly words, but the marchers kept on marching with their heads high, quietly. And I was looking from side to side. And I remember as we got closer to the Edmund Pettus Bridge on this day, as I looked down, I was in the middle of the marches. And as I looked down, I saw hundreds of policemen with billy clubs. I saw the state troopers. I saw the dogs. I saw the horses, the tear gas masks. And naturally, being a child, this would frighten me. My heart had begun to rumble. It started beating fast because like many others who were marching, I knew that something was about to happen. The leaders of that march, Congressman Lewis, he asked all of the marchers to kneel down and pray. And of course, after we had prayed, he was told to tell all of the marchers and to go back, and turn around. However, he refused. And once he refused, racism unleashed its brutality upon all of the marchers. Tear gas had begun to burst in the air. People were being beaten down with billy clubs as if they weren't human beings. The dogs and the horses had begun to push their way into the crowd, trampling over people. And of course, people had begun to start running for their lives, making, trying to make their way back to Brown's Chapel Church. And I could see people running, men of them crawling, crying, bleeding, and even fall. And I remember being very frightened like many others, not knowing what to do, but to try to make my way back home as that little girl. I was the youngest little girl on that march. And as I was trying to run and my eyes were burning from the tear gas, could hardly see. But as I was running, trying to make my way back to George Washington, Carver kind of Projects on that day. I'll never forget the late Hosea Williams picking me up. And as he was picking me up, my little legs were still galloping in his arm. And I turned to him with burning eyes and I said in my childish voice, put me down because you are not running fast enough. <laughs> <laughs> However, he continued to try to comfort me, among many others, as we were making our way back to George Washington Carver Projects. Instead of me going back to Brown's Chapel Church, I wanted to go home. And I was running home, and there my parents were standing in the door as if they were waiting for their child to come home. When they saw me, they opened the doors wide and I ran between them, <clears throat> just frantic, all the way up the stairs to my bedroom and they came behind to comfort me. And as they came to comfort me, I was crying. I never had experienced anything like that before in my life and even as I talk about it, even now, 60 years later almost, it's still painful. It's still painful, even though we have come a long way. 
when we reflect and when we even think about many of those changes that we are encountering today, it still can be painful. But I remember writing. And I started writing because that experience really taught me what the movement was all about. And there was a song that we often would sing that reflected the words of old freedom. Old freedom over me, over me. I'm before I be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave and go home to my Lord and be free. The picture of Bloody Sunday has never left my mind, neither my heart. Selma, Lord Selma. And because of my experiences as that little girl, a book has been written, several books have been written, that depicts my childhood memories of the Civil Rights Movement growing up in Selma and with Dr. King and others. And also a TV movie has been done. And I'm very <coughs> grateful for that. But even after 59 to 60 years, as I reflect on that bloody Sunday march in Selma, Alabama, I still often question just how far we have come as a people. Much blood, sweat, and tears had been shed, young people, on that bridge in an effort for African Americans to gain their right to vote. Even though in Selma, Alabama, we have elected two African American mayors. Even though we have elected our first African American president and our first American vice president, we still have a long way to go. Why? Because, number one, people still not voting. And the ratio of young voters are not voting, for the most part. 59 to 60 years later, the struggle is not over. Today, not only in southern states, but all over the United States. In many instances, racism still rears its head in an attempt to disarm people of their identity and respect. You know, as I get ready to close, let me say this. There's a quote by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. that has always stuck with me since childhood. Came from one of his speeches. And he stated, young people, that everyone can be great because everyone can serve. You only need a heart full of grace with a soul that's generated by love. That quote is one that I have lived by. You only need a heart full of grace with a soul that's generated by love. Greatness starts where purpose begins. Greatness is not obtained by being served, but greatness is always obtained by serving others. I chose to serve. I did not just go to school to find my career 
aspect of perspective in life. But I knew that I was going to do something, not just to make a difference in my life, but also to make a difference in the lives of others. Because I always understood through serving that when you're helping others, you're helping yourself. One of the greatest needs today is for us to come together in unity as a people. Now is the time for us to turn towards each other rather than away from each other. We need to stop pulling each other down and find ways and means that we can push each other up. We need to rid ourselves of the insecurities that hinders us because we need each other. We need to love each other. When we love each other, we win. Life can be so much better when we have each other. So as I close and go to my seat, let me say to all of you, and especially to our college students this morning, I wish for each of you a successful and rewarding life. Nothing good comes easy. There are so many challenges in life when you're trying to do what's right and when you're trying to do what's good. Don't ever let the challenges that you face in your life keep you or stop you from reaching your destiny, from reaching your visions, from reaching the goals in which you have set for your life, P pursue your dreams. Become the person in which you were created to be and accomplish all that you were put on this earth to be. And I would be remiss if I didn't tell you this, college students. Hopefully, if you're not a registered voter, you will become a registered voter. But I would be remiss if I didn't say this this morning. Never again take light of the power to vote. I can't tell you who to vote for. That's up to you. But what I can tell you is that you must let your voice be heard. You have got to stay woke. Y'all be saying, okay, I'm woke. You got to stay woke. You must wake up, perk up, get up, stand up, and show up at the polls to vote. Your voice is important. There's much work to be done, and you are the change agents that we are waiting for. You are the vessels of hope. You are voices of change, and you are our instruments of peace and progress. So if you want to see change, young people, then you must become a part of that change that you want to see. And it starts, it starts with you. Do something. Thank you so very much. few minutes for questions um, and then um, so let me see who would like to ask the first question I salute you um, Miss Christberg um, I know you I know I'm material I know you from key production because you helped raise my kids um, how did you go about from a college student starting that um, initiative? Well, one of the things when you uh, come to a point in life, even being young, 
where you really know the things that you're grateful for, that's a starting point for you to decide what are your purposes in life beside your academic pursuits. And I knew even before I went to college that I wanted to prick the consciousness of, of other young people, particularly uh, disadvantaged or poor, uh, to make a difference in their lives because it was others who made a difference in my life. And I'm glad that I, I, I chose that purpose for myself uh, and it has been uh, my, I've been a youth advocate from that time even to now for over 42 years and it has been very meaningful to me and others. And thank you so much for being a good parent with supporting us in that program. Good afternoon, everyone, to Ms. Kreisberg. I just want you to know, I don't have a question. I just want to thank you. You planted a seed in my life back at Alabama State University when I was running for Miss Christian Alabama. You made a difference in my life, and I just wanted to say thank you. I don't even know if you remember me being in, in the pageant, <laughs> but Benita Edwards, we're from Chicago, and she introduced me to you when I was a young person in college, and I just want to thank you. I went on, went, got my education, and I'm still here educating young people, and I just want to say thank you for being here. Thank you so much. You know, uh, I'm often asked questions uh, wherever I'm, I'm speaking, and, and oftentimes young people ask me, well, where do you start? You know, what, what, where do we go from here? Well, in our democracy now, there's, there are many significant uh, needs. First of all, you, you've got to know in the process, young people, that you matter. Uh, your work is very valuable and you are ultimate significant in this process as we uh, serve in our democracy. And if we want to keep uh, moving towards justice in this democracy to make changes, to help change policy, you just gotta do something. You gotta make up in your mind what, what piece it is that I have to offer that I can do to make a difference. And believe me, all of you have a gift, you have a talent, and you are intelligent enough to make a difference in this process, to make uh, your life and other lives better for all of us to live in. Thank much just because us as a young people who go to a one we need this and as you can see we're at a very diverse institution and even though like what you mentioned we are moving forward but we do have so far to go as a people and I want please excuse me I want to know what was the support like for you at the time as someone who was so young and impressionable? And I'd like also to thank you for bestowing us with your greatness. But I do want to know, what was it like for you as an eight-year-old who got to work on the front lines? What was the support like from your family and even from your peers? And how did you continue pressing on? Thank you so very much. Uh, initially, uh, I did not have the support uh, from my parents because they were afraid for me. It, was, it wasn't ordinary for adults to be a part of that movement, nevertheless a child. It was risky. Uh, anything could happen uh, on marches, at mass meetings, or what have you. But because I was so disobedient, I was always surrounded by courageous people. <laughs> and when you're surrounded by courageous people who have that made up mind and you know the efforts and the missions are good and right. I wouldn't tell a child to, today to go do what I did. But when you know it's something good and right that you want to do, and you want to make a difference, it starts with one. 
And when you're surrounded by people who have those same good and right missions and goals, and you understand them, because no one is going to pay you attention, pay you any attention if you're not doing nothing. But when you do something that's good and is done in the right way, the, the thing that made the difference during that movement uh, was Dr. King's nonviolent ministry. That was the biggest tool that made the difference during the civil rights movement. And, you know, I, I, I love seeing young people uh, being active today, but we got to see more organization, more strategies, more organizing. Uh, we're putting things in perspective and doing it the right way. And let me tell you this, young people, you don't have to have a title to be a leader. Yes, that's right. I think we have maybe one more question. Or if not, I'm sure, uh, please join me in thanking, again, the time My husband, Andre, I mean, I, I depend on him a whole lot now. <laughs> <laughs> If you all could do me a quick favor on the program on your table is a QR code. We would love you to scan that and give us feedback about today's event. Thank you again for coming, and please come back on November 6th to hear Reverend Cornelius Jackson. Thank you so much.